Hey travelers, efficiency. Pretty big deal nowadays. Of course, energy costs have been fluctuating and rising a lot in parts of the world. And of course, mining profitability is quite poor. So doing more with less, well, that makes sense. And I've always been a bit of a strong proponent for efficiency. Um, and I think there is quite a lot to talk about here. I think there's a few things a lot of people don't consider extensively. Um, and there's some pretty easy things that maybe you could put a little consideration into to help shave the watts off without impacting your hash rate. And of course, make you more efficient, make you more profitable. Now for most people, this isn't going to be the difference between being profitable and not. Of course, um, we're talking about a pretty small percentage gain, but well, a small percent here and there is always a good idea as long as it's cheap enough. Um, so I'll start with the things that I think are more or less the easiest ways to consider and save some power, and then we'll run down from there. There is actually quite a lot to talk about. So things like tuning GPUs and overall system design and stuff like that, I won't get too involved with that because that's going to need its own video. And I'll probably talk about that in a future video. But uh, I'll start with the general overview and kind of the important things that are sort of easy enough to do. First and foremost, I think the most important thing is system overview, the entire system needs to be considered. And what I mean by that is, a lot of people look at the power consumption DC of a single GPU. They say, well, this card takes 120 watts or something mining. Great, but that isn't including the board cost, the power supply losses, the network switch that you have plugged in. Like all these things matter, right? And if you have a monitor plugged in, is this taking power? Do you leave it on? Is the power supply taking three watts? even when it's switched off, you know, if you can't measure these things, or if you don't measure these things, you don't know. There's a lot of things like that. And on top of that, fans, pretty easy one, right? A lot of people, especially in the early days when mining profitability like two years ago was exceptional, people would just put fans everywhere, put high velocity fans on the floor, pointing up, very inefficient, box fans just everywhere and stuff. And a lot of times people would have a huge amount of fans running and they didn't really do anything. The, the cooling effect they got from the fan was trivial. One thing to consider is fans don't cool room, they heat it up. Fans, all they do is they move air. They don't cool the air. They actually add a little bit of heat because they take power and 100% of the power effectively ends up as heat. So if this fan takes 100 watts or so, it makes 100 watts of heat effectively. It does not cool the air. You could put 100 box fans in here, all you'll get is heat, it will never cool. The only way you cool a room is by moving air, exchanging air. So these fans, like you know, I still have this set up, these fans will blow air out. And that doesn't cool the room directly. What it does is it depressurizes here, which causes air to get pulled in through here. And if it's colder outside, well, then it'll get colder in here. But a lot of people got confused. They say, well, this fan must not be working good because the temperature's hot in here. It can only get as cold as it is outside. So if it's 100 degrees Fahrenheit outside, the best fan in the world with unlimited airflow could make it 100 degrees in here, right? <laughs> so we always got to consider the installation, the system, the design, very important. How much airflow is enough? Are you throwing airflow at, say, exchanging air through a building? And is it being used properly? Is it being wasted? Because you could get more airflow. You always could get more airflow. You could cut a bigger hole in, you could put a more powerful fan in. But if the power isn't going to anything useful, if all you're doing is lowering the temperature slightly, but you're putting a lot more power into it, what's the point, right? So these are the things you got to consider, but unfortunately, they're very specific to your system, your installation. But on things like these box fans, you can see I have box fans at the back of my rig, pretty common. And for these cards, you can see these fans, these are modified fan ducts that I make here. These push the air out the back, right? So for the most part, these cards will keep themselves fairly cool, even in a rack like this. And uh, when it was hot, it was helpful to have this fan on just to make sure there weren't like stagnant hot patches in there and stuff like that. It did help lower the temperatures a little bit and it was worth it when it was hot and mining profitability was good. But on these cards, the heat pretty much just goes up and around and swirls in front of here. Some of it goes out the back. So with these cards, you really need that box fan. Um, it's hard to get away without it unless it's very cold in here or we have a very open rack. Like you see, this rack is kind of enclosed on the top. It doesn't really make a big difference on these cards. Uh, you pretty much always got to run them with that box fan on. But I could get away with no problem running that box fan on low. And you can see where the box fan's aligned. You see the edge is around there, so it pushes air into the intake of this card and it ends around there, right? These rigs were designed to some extent to fit in a box fan. That's why they're stacked like this, because um, otherwise they'd be shoved in there and they'd be hot as hell and you need to put server fans on them to push the air forcefully through. 
But this box fan on low comfortably cools these cars, no problem. And in fact, um, I'm going to try to modify these fans to get a little bit less power and a little less airflow out of them because I don't need as much air as they're producing on low. And while they're so cheap, they're a great option to use. But yeah, nobody really makes like 15 watt box fans that are dirt cheap, at least that I can see. So the right amount of air for the job is important because the higher the temperature of the GPU, the higher the power consumption. And that's part of the trade-off. You could boost the fan speed and you could lower the temps maybe, but you also have more power consumption from the fan. So there's a trade-off there. There's a balance between fan life, fan power consumption, and the temperatures. Um, if you're in an environment like I am here, where you're cooling with outside air or you have large temperature swings, auto fans is probably a smart move. It'll boost the fan speed up when they get hotter, drop it down when they get cooler. So you kind of like, you could, if you tune it just right, which is tricky, you could get the best trade-off between efficiency, fan life, noise, these sorts of deals, and you could save a little bit of power in the process. Um, it is a little fickle though, because it's very hard to measure these minor power differences. If the card's running, say, 40C instead of 30C, the savings might be a watt, two, three watts, depends on the card. So it's not a ton of power, but it's a little bit. Um, and usually the trade-off is worth it until you get a certain point. Like if you're running the fans at like 60, 70, 80%, above that, oftentimes as a general rule, it's not worth it to keep pumping it. But if you really care about efficiency, and especially if you have a lot of the same cards, it's easy enough oftentimes, or maybe worthwhile to put the effort in to figure out what's the optimal temperature for this card? Above what temperature do I start seeing uh, runaway power increases? And you could graph it and stuff like that. You know, you can really go to town if you want. But I think a good tool to try to do something like that really well is something like this Elmore Labs PMB. This is going to be much more accurate, much more sensitive, much more reliable and repeatable than using the internal software power measurement. That's not the best. It's decent. It'll get you by. But really something like that is a great tool. Or you could always get alternatively a power meter like this and you could just measure, measure the whole rig power. Trouble with that is it fluctuates a lot and it's, it's a little messier and harder to read, but that works too. And tuning the cards is a complicated one. I probably will go into that in a future video. There's some gains to be had there, but it, it's really fickle and complicated. So it depends on the exact algorithm. But yeah, for this video, we're not gonna focus in on it. But you really gotta consider temperature of the cards as really a system. Airflow through the building and the power of that airflow airflow on the card, and of course the power of that airflow and the wear of the fans. And of course, if you also have an auxiliary cooler, you need to consider that as well. All these things are the system that I talk about that cool the car. And if you have AC, well, <laughs> yeah, try to get rid of the AC if you can, because that's going to be a lot of power. So even if you get the most efficient mini split, the cost of operation on that is very considerable. And I actually have a video talking about this on like it, where I talk about how to estimate the power, the energy consumption of an air conditioner based on the SEER rating or the energy efficiency rating, you can estimate how much energy it's going to consume to cool this heat load. Because um, of course, AC has a limited capacity. So you may not notice if you put 100 watts in the room, like one GPU, your AC isn't really going to be noticeably impacted, but it still takes more power to pump that heat. And the more cards you add, at some point it runs out of capacity and the room will no longer be able to be cooled. So again, part of the system I speak of. That's why people typically move towards airflow because it's much cheaper when you're talking about high heat loads and your cost of operation is much lower. The install cost is lower. But yeah, either way, very important to consider the system. Try to utilize airflow that you have as effectively as possible. And in some situations, especially if you're in a colder climate, try to get rid of these fans. Try to eliminate them. Maybe stack two rigs back to back. See if you could get away with that. See if you could get away with putting one of these rigs in front of the other. Maybe it'll run 5C cooler, 5C hotter, I should say. But if you're in a cool enough environment, maybe it doesn't matter. Um, and maybe you could save 60 watts from a box fan, right? Little tips and tricks like this. You could also do ducting. It's a valid option because these fans, you can see a lot of the air gets wasted flowing around it. And it's not hyper efficient. Um, for how I have it set up, it isn't really an issue. And it's complicated reasons, I could go into it later. But you could set up ducting around here with cardboard and foam board, pretty much anything really. And um, you know, maybe try to make it flame retardant, but it's kind of hard to do actually. There's not a ton of materials that are rigid, cheap, and flame retardant. 
But if you could put ducting around here, you could force this there more efficiently through the rig. You have less losses on the side. And then maybe if you needed high before, because you had a lot of hot cards, maybe you could get away with medium or low. And that's cheap, that's easy. On top of that, uh, there's a few things you could do. I mean, obviously the design of your rig, if you're at that stage, is important. You gotta consider everything takes power. You have control over some things, like maybe you have a boot drive. How much power does it take? Can you look it up? Are you running it on a flash drive? I know this sounds trivial, but some flash drives take six, seven, eight watts. Uh, some will take two or three. And if you have a bunch of rigs and you're running all the same deployment, it makes sense to try to figure out what's the most efficient flash drive for your application. And the fan speed on your CPU cooler. Oftentimes the CPU is idle and running cool. Can you put the fan down on there? Can you save power there? Can you get a different um, a memory stick or something, a low power DDR3 instead of the regular DDR3 or whatever you're running, right? A lot of considerations there. The power supplies. This is a pretty complicated one, but a lot of times these will be more efficient in the middle range. So, you know, of course you could load the power supply anywhere from say 0% to 100% of its rating, right? Typically you try to stay away from that 100% value for safety reasons, among other things. But usually power supplies are most efficient, somewhere in the middle. Um, that's partly because of the laws, partly because of how they work. The ratings on these say that they need to hit a certain efficiency in the middle, certain efficiency on the high end. And um, usually when they say they're saying 96% or titanium efficiency, what they mean is that 50% load is 96%. It could be much lower on the low end and a little bit lower on the high end. And it depends on the efficiency tier as to how much lower. Um, but generally speaking, around 50% is where they're most efficient. So if you have an option, like say I have two power supplies here. If you have the option of say, you have one power supply that's lightly loaded and another one that's heavier loaded, can you move rigs? Can you move cards from one power supply to the other to get around 50, 60, 70% on a power supply to bring one down that's heavily loaded? And you also gotta consider if you have multiple power supplies, say ATX power supplies or anything, if they have different efficiency ratings, can you move rigs so you put more of the power on the more efficient power supply? And if you have something like this, you may be able to save 10, 15, 20 watts on your rig just from moving stuff, especially if you have multiple power supplies that are different. Um, but you do need something like this to be able to measure the AC power. That's really the best way to go because your DC power and your minor, that won't change. Um, so you really gotta actually test and measure. And there's a lot of things like that that you could do to try and optimize your rig. But the cool thing about this stuff is oftentimes there's a bit of optimization you could do with the hardware you already have. Moving things around, making sure your stuff is loaded evenly so you don't have one power supply sitting at 80% load and one at 15, 20% load or something. Sometimes you see stuff like that where people have one ATX power supply running the motherboard and it's at super low load and it's running relatively inefficiently. You might, even be, able to, you might be able to save total system power by loading that ATX power supply more and shifting load from another power supply. But it depends on your system, it depends on your application, all these sorts of things. Um, let's see, from there, I mean, that's kind of like the bulk of it that I could think of, things that are easy. Other than buying stuff, of course, you could always go around and buy stuff. You could buy higher efficiency power supplies, but you know, it's money, and so the trade-off is if you have 94% efficiency, Moving to 96% almost never makes economic sense unless you plan on running for 10 years. And well, realistically, that's, I don't think that's a reasonable thing to think of right now. I don't think anticipating the run for 10 years is really too practical for most people. So I wouldn't be spending money to save it in five, six, seven, eight years. That's kind of unreasonable. So buying hardware to save money is kind of, it's, it's a tricky thing. You could do it, but if you start plugging the numbers in, oftentimes it doesn't make any sense. Really, I think the way to go is to consider the entire system, the entire chain. A lot of people neglect power consumption of minor attributes or what they think is minor. You know, if you could get away with one thing rather than two, of course, try and do that. If you could get a, one of these network switches off there, I know it seems trivial, but I worry about these kinds of things. They take like two watts or something like that. Like oftentimes there's things you could do with just minor reconfiguration to save power. A lot of things like these splitters, they take almost no power. I tried measuring it, it's very, very low. It's like less than 0.1 watts. It does depend on the splitter, but a lot of these are very low power. These are the two-way splitters. These actually take less power per port than the four ways. Yeah, <laughs> not by a lot, but by a little bit. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess that kind of covers the things I wanted to go over.
I don't know. I'll probably do more detailed videos in the future because there really is a lot of nuance here. Um, but I guess until next time, say Ashen.